Welcome to Technical, a bi-coastal podcast where Silicon Alley meets Silicon Valley. This is a podcast for technology professionals, so we go pretty deep. I'm your host, Bill Kozell of Tech Writers NYC. At Tech Writers NYC, we translate geek speak. Visit us at techwriters.nyc. Well, they don't get much more legendary than Dr. Vinton Gray Cerf. Along with Robert Kahn, Dr. Cerf developed the code for what would become the internet, the Transmission Control Protocol and the Internet Protocol, also known as TCP IP. Think about that for a moment. Every time you log onto the web, you are using code that Vint and Bob created. That's why he and Bob are known as the fathers of the internet. While still in high school, Vint worked on the Apollo space program for a company called Rocketdyne. His first job after obtaining his bachelor's degree from Stanford was with IBM. He left IBM to get his master's and PhD degrees at UCLA, where he worked on a data packet networking group that connected the first two nodes of the ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet. He moved to the U.S. Department of Defense in 1976, where he developed the TCP IP protocols with Bob Kahn. He is also responsible for MCI Mail, the first commercial email service to be connected to the Internet. Dr. Cerf has won virtually every technology award there is, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of Technology, the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Medal, the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, the Marconi Prize, and the Turing Prize the tech equivalent of the Nobel, and we're just scratching the surface of his accomplishments. I know this is a long intro, but if anyone deserves it, he does. Since 2005, Dr. Cerf has been the Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist and the eminence grise for Google. Dr. Cerf's assistant, Carla Lefevre, says he prefers to be called Vint. So I have the great honor of welcoming Vint Cerf to my program. Welcome to Technical, Vint. Thanks for having me on the show, Bill. At the Internet Society event I attended, you spoke passionately about the preservation of digital assets and about a digital dark age. We're only one-fifth of the way through the 21st century, and it's only going to get worse as new standards are created. Why is it so important that we preserve these assets, and what are the challenges? So uh, I'm amused by the term uh, digital dark age, especially if you mispronounce it and say it's a digital dork age. And <laughs> you could have, we could have an entire conversation on either of those two interpretations. Uh, but let me stick with the, the dark age problem. My big worry uh, is that we create a huge quantity now of digital content, whether it's our images that go up on Facebook or Snapchat or other or the texts that we uh, send each other, or the blogs that we put up, or the web pages that we manage, uh, the, the other social media, the, you know, uh, Twitter, uh, for instance, among others. So there's this huge amount of digital content uh, that uh, we collectively produce. And one of the interesting questions is, what is its long-term likelihood of being available? Um, I suspect that many people will say, well, most of it isn't worth anything, so it doesn't matter if it goes away. Uh, on the other hand, you and I might think that at least some of what uh, what either we have generated or what we have encountered is uh, important and valuable and worthy of um, you know, uh, preservation. Uh, the problem is none of us has uh, enough memory, uh, literally physical memory, uh, in order to record and capture everything that we might think is valuable. And in fact, we're misled into thinking it's all there all the time because the web feels like it's there all the time and that everything is there. Uh, it's there when you search for it and until it isn't. Right. And, and it is this, this momentary shock of, oh, my God, uh, page not found. Uh, what happened? Is the website gone? Is the data erased? Uh, and what am I going to do if I was relying on that? Uh, from the academic point of view, uh, it's quite uh, troublesome because we publish papers now with URLs in them that are you know, footnoted, for example, uh, to bolster our uh, views, our analyses and the like. And if 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 years from now, someone reading our work is unable to find the corroborating documents because the web uh, pages are gone, the URL with its domain name no longer resolves, the domain name is no longer in use, uh, then we've actually uh, harmed our descendants, our academic descendants, because they can't get the data that corroborated our arguments. Right. So, so it gets more exacerbated when you start thinking about scientific data. 
the data that we collect about the environment, mm. uh, data we collect from the rovers that are on Mars or the various telescopes that are either on planet Earth or in space. Imagine all of that data and the metadata associated with it, the calibration data associated with the instruments, for some reason is not adequately preserved. Well, now we've lost important scientific information uh, that we might have used to go back and uh, perhaps reconfirm or confirm a new theory. Uh, so as historians, by the way, will also tell you that um, sometimes you don't know that something is important until 100 or 200 years later or more. Uh, because it was a key communication, a particular policy position, an action that was taken, a private email that was exchanged uh, that might turn out to be the key to understanding something important that happened in history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to bring this home to ordinary users, think of all the photographs that we take with our mobiles. Uh, they often end up on the mobile, sometimes they end up in the cloud. Uh, if, if you value those uh, photographs, those images or videos, uh, what is to guarantee that they will stay in the cloud? What if the cloud provider goes away? And what if they decide this isn't a good business anymore? Uh, what should you do? Yeah, and, yeah. So we are, we are many, many different reasons for being concerned about this. The digital records that we need for daily life, for example, our transactions, uh, real estate transactions, for instance, which should be recorded somewhere, uh, are important documents like birth certificates, death certificates, uh, marriage certificates, uh, other you know uh, important uh, bona fides like our um, our college degrees or certificates of training. All of those uh, often have a digital manifestation. And once again, if those things are not adequately preserved, what happens when you want to cite them in order to make uh, an argument that you should be granted some uh, permission to do something or you have the bona fides to undertake a project? So, so are, there, are there enough servers on Earth to store all that data? Well, you know, this this is one of the questions about do we preserve everything? And I am not advocating that we should preserve everything, even even if Google wanted to. I don't think that it could. However, I think that there should be tools around that you can invoke if you thought something should be preserved. And so there is this this capacity to preserve in the in the functional sense. There is capacity to preserve in the literally the digital memory sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I am not advocating that we should remember everything, but I am saying that we should have um, the ability to preserve things that we all generally believe need to be preserved, you know, mm -hmm. financial transactions or certainly real estate transactions, intellectual property transactions have uh, long-term significance uh, and have historical importance. So the same is true for patents, for example. Patent filings are extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we need to find a way to preserve those and think about the National Archives here in the United States, which is supposed to capture uh, the records of each uh, presidential administration. Uh, they, too, are faced with this uh, digital preservation problem because they receive laptops and desktops or hard drives and so on. And they have to find a way to catalog them, to index them, to capture uh, the content and understand you know, which software is needed in order to read the documents? Is this a Microsoft Word document? Is it a PDF? Is it a, a spreadsheet? Is it something else? Uh, which is an intensely difficult thing to do because the vintages of the various um, devices that are used in government will vary over time. The software will vary over time. And yet the archive has to be able to uh, extract and retain utility uh, of that information. Mm -hmm. You've been Google's chief internet evangelist since 2005. What are your goals for 2018? Well, I can tell you the ones that I am uh, most concerned about. The first is continued spread of the internet, mm -hmm. something I would like very much to pr uh, promote. Uh, we are at about 50% of the world's population right now. And uh, we have, again, another 3.7 million people to go, 3.7 3 billion people to go. Mm -hmm. So that's very high on my priority list. Second thing we just talked about, which is preservation of digital content and finding technical ways uh, to do that, finding business models that will sustain the preservation and finding legal regimes, for example, that would allow a library, 
uh, or an archive, uh, to have the right to hold the content, including software, uh, which it might then need to um, execute on behalf of third parties in order to render uh, or allow interaction with a particular digital object, for example, a spreadsheet. So, uh, so the digital preservation is very high on my agenda for 2018. Uh, the third thing which is very high on my agenda is, is trying to cope uh, with the many deficiencies of, in security and safety that we are encountering in the yeah. online environment. Mm -hmm. This is exacerbated by the uh, avalanche of uh, devices, so-called Internet of Things, that may become part of the Internet landscape, containing software which has not necessarily been uh, well thought out or hasn't been uh, configured for maximum safety and security. Uh, I'm very worried about uh, malfunctions, uh, about um, misconfigurations, about uh, inappropriate access control, either invading privacy or actually interfering with operations. So it's a huge, uh, really complex space. So IoT is on my list of important things to worry about. And, mm -hmm. and finally, um, as we all recognize uh, the uh, difficulties of retaining privacy uh, in the online environment, uh, how should we uh, try to cope with that as everyone runs around with their uh, high resolution cameras taking pictures of everything and uploading them and sharing them? Uh, that, ex that concern expands into the broader uh, question of uh, safety and security, uh, defense against malware, uh, defense against um, denial of service attacks, uh, invasion of privacy, uh, identity theft, uh, fraud, all kinds of abuse, uh, the, whether that's uh, har harassment or, uh, or child pornography or other kinds of abuses that uh, we often encounter. So one hard question is what to do about all that, uh, particularly in an international setting. What kinds of cooperation might we look for uh, across international boundaries? Uh, to what extent can we outfit the user population with means to defend themselves uh, against these various uh, harmful uh, uh, possibilities, uh, including uh, providing them with two-factor authentication and other strong ways of inhibiting uh, hijacking of someone's account? Uh, so we have to teach people digital literacy from an early age mm -hmm. uh, and, and help them feel both comfortable and motivated to exercise uh, their uh, digital uh, literate skills to protect themselves from uh, various kinds of risk and, and potential attack. So my goodness, that's and that's just <laughs> the first four things. There are five things on the list and <laughs> much I, there's much more. I'll add one more just because it's such a tasty uh, thing, and that's the continued evolution of the interplanetary Internet. Uh, that's what I was uh, going to ask you about next. Yeah, uh, we, we are uh, at the moment in the middle of a study uh, for NASA. Uh, not, Google is not doing this. This is a, 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 a NASA-wide um, effort to look at what it would mean to deploy the delay and disruption tolerant networking protocol, the bundle protocol, on uh, all new spacecraft and, of course, some already existing ones uh, in order to improve our ability to support manned and robotic space exploration as we mm. uh, explore the rest of the solar system. So that, too, is uh, on my list of things to, uh, to attack this year. That segues nicely into my Internet of Things question. Uh, how long do you think it will be before we have uniform standards for the Internet of Things? Uh, well, I think that we could probably anticipate that the, there will be lots of standards. <laughs> and yeah. that's the problem. There, there many, are, yes. Yeah. yeah, there will be too many of them. So uh, coming to some sort of, uh, I would say, a coherence in the uh, Internet of Things standard space, it's going to take time. It will be partly a matter of technology and partly, frankly, a matter of tipping points where some particular product becomes more popular than than the others and becomes the sort of uh, uh, poster child for a particular set of protocols. Mm. I'm guessing that we're talking about five years before we would see this sort of settle down because there's an awful lot of unknown uh, issues arising uh, in this space. And I think we will literally have to live through some of the mistakes that people make and some of the uh, you know, protocol deficiencies that we encounter mm -hmm. before we have a, a, best, a better sense anyway, if not the best sense, 
of what protocols ought we to uh, standardize uh, and then uh, make uh, uh, reinforceable uh, with regard to safety and security and reliability. Uh, we recently had a conversation with NVIDIA's Ian Buck about deep learning and neural networks. Where do you see those technologies going in the next five to 10 years? Well, it's, I would say that we are on quite a tear right now, generally, with regard to machine learning. Uh, this is triggered largely by having uh, very la large-scale multi-layer neural networks uh, that uh, can be trained to do very complex and, and sophisticated things. Despite the sophistication, though, there's still the applications that are the most spectacular are quite narrow. I mean, playing Go is quite impressive. Alpha, alpha uh, Zero, uh, which learned how to play Go in a few days' time, but was playing at grandmaster level, is uh, quite stunning. Mm -hmm. but on the other hand, uh, it's easy to point out things that a two-year-old child can do that uh, no programs are able to do. Mm -hmm. So. We have a long ways to go in terms of general intelligence uh, exhibited by these systems, not just multi-layer neural networks, but possibly others as well. On the other hand, I am confident that we're going to see a um, very a large number of narrowly based uh, functions uh, subject to uh, machine learning. Uh, and so, for, for example, some control systems uh, are really good candidates for this kind of training. In our case, in our data centers, we have a cooling system, which is essentially managed by pumps and by opening and closing valves and uh, choosing pump speeds and things like that. Uh, and it costs us a certain amount of money to cool a data center uh, because we consume power to run the pumps and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've discovered that by applying machine learning that we can reduce the cost of the power needed to run the pumps to cool the system by a factor of 40 percent wow uh, yeah that was my reaction too it was just plain wow uh so there's a good example of an optimizable thing it's very very clear uh optimum criterion which is uh, reduce the amount of power required to cool the data center uh, and so that propagates back up into the neural network. Uh, so these, these are the kinds of applications I'm anticipating. I'm not really expecting a lot of general purpose intelligence, though, uh, to come um, to the fore, at least not in the short term. At the ISOC event, you also said, I'm, I'm just a humble programmer, which got a big laugh. Uh, you've written about responsible programming. What do you mean by that? Oh, that's thank you. That's a very important question. I think that uh, the programmers have an ethical responsibility to be extremely thoughtful about the code that they write and the dependence that people will have on it. Uh, it's particularly true, of course, in self-driving cars and robotic medical instruments and things mm -hmm. like that. But I think it's just as true for the thermostat, you know, as it is for the Da Vinci, uh, you know, uh, uh, robot, the uh, operational uh, robot. Surgical, surgical, surgical robot. Yeah, yes, yeah. intuitive surgical is, is the company that makes mm -hmm. it. Uh, I think with all of us who make a living writing software, uh, have this ethical responsibility to be very thoughtful about who is depending on this stuff, what happens if it doesn't work right, what can I do to avoid making stupid mistakes, uh, how can I detect those mistakes if I have made them, how do I update the software, how do I make sure that the device receiving new software is not receiving malware from some improper source. Mm. Uh, all of those concerns uh, are on the table. And uh, I think we still have a lot of work to do to, to put incentives in place that will cause companies to adopt practices that uh, uh, would produce the desired result, which is better quality software. So uh, what else are you interested in? Are you interested in music, theater, sports, geology, uh, et cetera? Uh, well, let's see. I am not a sports person to be. I'm in, um, embarrassingly ignorant. And so if somebody names a team, I won't really know if it's a basketball team or a football <laughs> team or something else. Uh, I am a classics music fan. I tend not to listen to anything composed after 1850. Um, I am newly and deeply interested in uh, cell microbiology, uh, yeah. mic microchemical uh, uh, behavior or processes in cells. Uh, not that I'm an expert, but because I am so fascinated with the way cells work. And, uh, and the result uh, is that... Um, I've become fascinated by 
how cells work and particularly how they don't work. Uh, and without going into a long monologue, uh, you know, cells normally are programmed to live for a certain period of time to reproduce a number of times and then essentially commit suicide. It's called cell apoptosis. Mm. Mm. Some of the cells don't do that. Some of them continue to, re to reproduce for an ad infinitum. We call that cancer. Others uh, don't die and they aren't cancerous, but they start cranking out toxins. And we call those uh, well, I call them grumpy old cells, <laughs> uh, but there is a um, there's a, a medical term uh, for a cell which has reached this senescent state where it's it's uh, senile almost, uh, still alive, not reproducing, but producing toxic chemicals that uh, harm your body. So all of that is of great interest to me, especially as I get older, uh, and so I'm finding myself digging deep into what is known and what is not known about uh, uh, nuclear cell uh, or prokaryote or eukaryote cells. Uh, so even your hobbies are complex. Uh, well, I also love good wine and, uh. Uh, and, and good food. And so I'm a happy uh, uh, collector and consumer of wines. I don't uh. collect the wines to resell them. I collect them to drink them. So, <laughs> So uh, I keep that in mind when I uh, acquire a bottle. Uh, and finally, if you're not tired of talking about it, uh, could you please tell us about the development of the Internet Protocol or and your work for DARPA? Uh, if, you, well, if you don't want to, you don't have to. No, no, no it's fine. Uh, well, first, it should be understood that I'm not the only person who was involved in this. Bob yeah, Conkine Con, yes. started, started the Internet Protocol development work in 73, but Steve Crocker deserves credit mm. along with several others for the developing the predecessor host-to-host -host protocol for the ARPANET, for example. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as the uh, Internet project unfolded, I went from running my bit of it at Stanford to running the entire program at DARPA starting in uh, 1976. Uh, many, many hands uh, have touched these protocols mm -hmm. or invented new ones. And it's a tribute, I think, to the institutions that were invented, the International Network Working Group, the Internet Architecture Board, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the Internet Research Task Force. Uh, these institutions, plus the Internet Society and ICANN and the regional Internet registries and so on, uh, were all uh, created at need and the protocols permitted to be invented or adapted uh, because the architecture was so open and the philosophy was so open to contributions from others. And so if there's a huge success to be cited here, I think it is that the network continues to be a very open technical environment where new ideas are welcome. Uh, so what is the software that runs VintSurf? <laughs> well, it's wetware. Uh, and, uh, and all I can say is that uh, I have a dose of DNA from other uh, and it seems to have in it a, a great dose of curiosity, uh -huh. a, desire, a desire not to grow up, <laughs> getting 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 older is uh, is inescapable, but growing up is optional. <laughs> to, to borrow somebody else's quote, uh, I I live a very very privileged life, one which uh, allows me all kinds of opportunities to learn new things uh, and encounter new ideas, and I, I really live for that. Uh, I think the world would be pretty boring if you knew everything there was to know. Right now, I know I know hardly anything. Mm -hmm. that there is to know, and so I'm not worried about running out of new things to learn. My guest has been Vince Cerf, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google. Thanks so much for being here, Vint. Oh, thanks, Bill. I enjoyed the chat. You can learn more about Vince Cerf at research.google.com. That's it for this edition of Technical. Technical is a production of Tech Writers NYC. For Technical and Tech Writers NYC, I'm Bill Cozell. See you next time.